In Georgia, the governor is poised to sign one of the most restrictive anti-abortion laws in the country. Missouri State Senate passed an eight-week abortion ban containing no exceptions for victims of rape, incest, or human It comes right on the heels of Alabama's even stricter legislation. In 2019, nine U.S. states passed laws that would ban abortion in the beginning stages of pregnancy, as early as six weeks, before many women even know they're pregnant. The state of Georgia recognizes the benefits of providing full legal recognition of an unborn child. Alabama went the furthest and banned the procedure from the moment of conception. Just a few years ago, the bills were considered politically toxic an extreme proposal by a fringe element of the anti-abortion movement. Over 60 million innocent babies have been legally murdered here in America. This is a crime against humanity and a sin against God. This but this year, they swept through Republican-controlled state houses and were signed into law. The laws are being challenged in court, and none are yet in effect. A federal judge has blocked Ohio's so-called fetal heartbeat law. This bill is not about pro-life. This bill is about control. For the first time, this state will make Georgia women criminals, criminals for seeking basic reproductive care. Okay, I have a little pinch right here now. These laws are part of a strategy to challenge Roe v. Wade the Supreme Court decision that made abortion legal across the country almost 50 years ago. Do you think a majority of people in Georgia wanted this bill to pass, the heartbeat bill? Absolutely not. Was this law written to challenge Roe? Yes, of course it was. Fault Lines travels to Alabama and Georgia, two of the states on the front lines of this battle. You are set for next Saturday the 7th at 7.45 in the morning. To ask what's at stake when access to abortion is under threat, and how far can these laws go? I knew that this bill would create a new pathway to criminalize black and brown women, which you've already seen the disproportionate effects in the criminal justice system. These are the latest attempts, not merely to overturn Roe v. Wade and the right to choose abortion. They are about establishing in the law the fact that women have a second-class status. Alabama has become ground zero for the country's ideological battle over abortion and the fight over what should prevail the rights of women or the unborn. Yeah, these babies already have heartbeats. In May, the state passed the most restrictive abortion law in the country, banning it in nearly all cases, including rape and incest. It's the latest chapter in the anti-abortion movement's decades-long campaign to end abortion. I just found this on the floor. Yeah, what is this? Those are uh, the, one of the fake dolls that they hand out. They hand this out? Yeah, they'll try to like tell you that's what your fetus looks like. For years, they've chipped away at abortion access by pushing for laws that make operating clinics difficult, if not impossible. And they've succeeded. 50 clinics closed in the American South between 2011 and 2017. Under the new legislation, doctors who perform abortions could face up to 99 years in prison. Louis Payne is the main abortion provider here and has been a doctor for 50 years. Has your clinic ever experienced any kind of threats or has there anything ever happened? Yeah, we've had, you know, the arson fire that was total destruction in 97, and then we had the uh, window shot out one time, and then we had the guy that drove his car into the waiting room. OK, a little warm gel. The new laws could have far-reaching implications, not only for abortion clinics, but for anyone who becomes pregnant. They're part of a fetal personhood movement, which seeks to give fertilized eggs, embryos, and fetuses the same legal rights as people. All right, tonight, got you at Five weeks, five days. You want to see it? That little black 
oval between the two plus signs is the sac that contains the pregnancy. The embryo is inside of that. It's too small to see this early. Are you doing pill or surgery? Pill? Okay. The 1973 Supreme Court ruling, Roe v. Wade, said that states can't restrict a woman's right to an abortion until the fetus becomes viable and can survive outside the uterus. According to the ruling, that can start at 24 weeks. But the Supreme Court sidestepped the question of personhood and refused to, quote, resolve the difficult question of when life begins. And that's where Eric Johnston, a lawyer who drafted Alabama's bill, saw an opening. That if medical science can prove that an unborn child is a person, then it gets the rights under the Constitution. And I think that our purpose in our law in Alabama is to approach it that way. You know, they didn't have the sonograms and the ultrasounds and the fetal photography that we have now. It's women like Nora, a 20-year-old student who would be directly impacted by this law. I'm getting an abortion, and I'm choosing to do the surgical procedure. Okay, so this is the one your procedure is going to be done again. She's five weeks pregnant. But inside me, I've seen the ultrasound, like it's the size of a pea. It doesn't have a brain, it doesn't have a heartbeat, like it's not anything that's actually living. These are knee stirrups, the back of your legs go in there and slide right to the end of the table. Most people saying this stuff, it's men, and so they don't understand the responsibility and pressure that puts on women to say that anything that's inside you is now like your responsibility and you have to give birth to it and like carry that for the rest of your life. And it's also saying a fetus isn't only equal to a woman, but it's like more important than a woman's personhood because like I, that means I don't get to choose. What would it mean for you if you didn't have the option to have an abortion right now? I don't know. I'd probably drop out of school and like probably move back home and live with my mom. And that'd be like a nightmare situation. Yeah, I don't know what I would do. Probably try some at-home method that would be really dangerous. All right, now go numb your service. You'll have some little sticks. This will make the rest of the procedure more comfortable. Stick. If these abortion bans go into effect, it would mean going back to a time before abortion was legal nationwide. Dr. Payne, who's 80, remembers that time well. Of course, there were a lot of illegal abortions. Some of them would die. A lot of them would lose their uterus, lose their uh, reproductive ability. And uh, that's the way it was back then. And that's what, well, it won't ever go back to that because they're not going to outlaw abortion. But a post-Row world is what Johnston was imagining when he wrote Alabama's bill in the summer of 2018, as President Trump was gearing up to nominate conservative judge Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court. Were you thinking this is our moment? Not necessarily. I was thinking that the circumstances are about as favorable as they may ever be. Mm -hmm. There are several factors that have brought us to that. Probably the biggest ones would be two new justices on the Supreme Court. We think that they are likely to reverse Roe, if given the opportunity. And that's why 2019, all of a sudden, like a, a year, a watershed year for these kinds of laws. In, in Roe, there were two competing concepts. One was the privacy rights, the individual rights of the woman. The other was the rights of the unborn child. And the U.S. Supreme Court said, well, since the unborn child is not a person, then the woman, within her rights of privacy, has a right to have an abortion. Keep your legs up for me, Now, if the unborn child is a person, then that trumps the rights of the woman because it's the rights of two individuals. That's a fiction. How do you feel? Are you okay? It hurt more than I thought it would. The fact is that as long as that life is inside of another human being, there is no way to treat it as a matter of law as if it's separate without taking away the personhood of the pregnant woman. What has been called the fetal personhood movement is an attempt by political activists to establish as a matter of law separate rights for fertilized eggs, embryos, and fetuses so that police and prosecutors and legislators, husbands and other outsiders can control the people who get pregnant, women.
If Alabama provided fertile ground for shaping the country's most extreme anti-abortion law, Georgia has become the center of the resistance. In May, lawmakers here passed a so-called heartbeat bill, effectively banning abortion at around six weeks. Any bill that outlaws or restricts a woman's right to access abortion care is a bill that is calling for the policies of forced birthing for women. And we do not need your condescending bills that challenge our bodily autonomy. One of the most fervent opponents was State Representative Renita Shannon. As soon as this bill was introduced, I immediately called it what it is, which is a forced birthing bill for the women of Georgia. And I had promised myself that if this bill hit the floor, I would speak so long that I would force the Speaker of the House to physically remove me. And other health professionals must report unlawful criminal acts that they become aware of the in the context of their She dissented on the grounds that black women would be hit hardest by the ban. Require ...is protected the under the terms of professional the secrecy. Maternal mortality tracks women dying due to complications related to pregnancy up to a year after giving birth. And if you look at countries that have outlawed abortion, immediately you see a spike, sometimes up to 50% of more women dying in maternal mortality. And black women are already three to four times more likely to die than their white counterparts. And it is the reason why black and brown women have come out so fiercely against this bill. The bill's main sponsor was Georgia Representative Ed Setzler. The issue before this house is the question of when should human life be protected by the law. We're trying to give recognition to disenfranchised groups that had not gotten full and appropriate recognition in the past. I think one of the groups that's been ignored now for decades has been the unborn. The bill passed by a narrow margin and was signed into law by the state's Republican governor, Brian Kemp. He and other Georgia officials are now being sued in an effort to stop the law. Kemp's office declined repeated requests for an interview. Governor Kemp? Governor Kemp? We'll have time for questions. The press lady said we did. The lead plaintiff in the lawsuit is Sister Song, a social justice collective focused on reproductive health led by women of color. Monica Simpson is their executive director. She's also a soul singer. The lawsuit argues that black, low-income, and rural women would be disproportionately impacted by the abortion ban, and points out that black women in particular face some of the highest pregnancy-related deaths in the country. The legacy of forced reproduction under slavery still looms large. We're talking about being able to make decisions for ourselves, make decisions for our bodies. Because what I refuse to do is to go back to a day where our states are controlling our bodies. That sounds like a very scary time that my ancestors lived through that allowed me to be here today, and I'm not going back. I know they're mad at me for doing what I said I would do, but I think most Georgians appreciate that. Since black people arrived in this country, we have effectively had white men telling us what to do with our bodies. In slave times, we were force bred um, to create more slaves. We were uh, raped by slave masters. So this is par for the course. And we see the same thing by a party that is majority white men, again, now trying to tell black and brown women especially what is best for their bodies. This is black genocide. This is the number one cause of death for black people in America. Ma'am, will you come down and speak with us, please? You don't say that, sir. That's not something you say. That is very racist. That's racist. That's racist. Abortion rates have been falling for more than a decade across racial groups and income levels. But women of color and those living in poverty are more likely than their white counterparts to have abortions. That's because they're less likely to have access to quality contraception and health care. And so then when you come here and you hear people like him 
saying that they'll take care of your baby. And then... They're not. How, how are you going to do that? The anti-abortion movement has used these statistics to claim that women of color are being targeted for abortion. It's not worth it. I promise you. Who? 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 No, 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 Who's there no. killing children? Who? How? Did you have a I have not seen any of these pro-life people at a Black Lives Matter rally. I have not seen them at the maternal health conference, but we're talking about creating the best outcomes for folks who are pregnant. And I have not seen them talking about economic justice or environmental justice. They're not talking about any of that. They're talking about fetuses. God will provide everything you need if you will trust in him, man. Please, just trust in God. And if you only care about a fetus, but you don't care about the world that that fetus would have to live in, or if you don't care about the life of the person that's carrying that fetus, then you are not about life. Ma'am. Oh, oh, homie. Say, I'm coming down to carry. I can meet you. I don't want to talk to you. Try to offer the woman help. People who do not understand or subscribe to this commitment to reproductive justice are trying anything they can to deny us the ability to have what we need. It's not just as narrow as have a baby or don't have a baby. Having an abortion at one point in their lives might be the very thing that helps them to grow their families later. Look at you. I already knew you was coming in the world to do something big, girl. This is absolutely a civil rights issue of our day. But reproductive justice advocates that we talked to said they feel that black women and women of color are some of the most negatively impacted by your bill. They say that this is an example of white men telling black women what they can do with their bodies. Uh, it's a false premise. I, I, I reject that sort of as on, on its on its. On its That's basis. your answer to them. It's a false premise. It's a false premise. You know, we, we as a as a legislature are responding to a very diverse Georgia. It's amazing the people that they think they're speaking for that support our bill. These lawmakers say that they are protecting life. So what is your response then? Whose life? Whose life are you concerned with? You don't have to dehumanize the pregnant person in order to assign humanity to the cells that are growing inside of her. If these fetal personhood laws are allowed to move forward, there's concern it could open a Pandora's box. Found out at three weeks that I was pregnant. A pregnant woman would legally be considered two people. And states would have more power to charge pregnant women for behavior that otherwise wouldn't be considered criminal. And how are you feeling this morning? I'm feeling good. That's good. And this is your first pregnancy? It is. Okay. Abortion advocates worry that this bill could end up criminalizing women that have miscarriages or abortions. Is that a legitimate concern? There's, there's zero legal basis for that. Are women going to be criminalized for trying to end pregnancies themselves? Under our statute, no. The woman is not criminalized. It's got a spe uh, specific exemption for her. He's a lawyer, I'm a lawyer. There are a whole bunch of other laws in Alabama. Their murder statute, their manslaughter statute, their chemical endangerment of a child statute. There are child abuse laws. There's an innumerable, practically, list of laws that could be used to arrest a pregnant woman, all based on the theory of separate rights for fetuses. So excluding arrest from a single statute, the abortion statute, really means nothing, especially in a state where women are already being arrested, hundreds of them, in relationship to their pregnancy. A woman from Alabama suffered a miscarriage after being shot, and now she's being charged with manslaughter for the death of her unborn child. Since 1973, more than 1,200 women have been arrested or detained in connection with their pregnancies, according to data from the National Advocates for Pregnant Women and ProPublica. Half of these cases were in Alabama. Women who have had a home birth with a midwife, women who have delayed having cesarean surgery, women who've had stillbirths, miscarriages, or given birth to babies they couldn't guarantee would survive, have been arrested for manslaughter and first-degree murder and second-degree murder. If you travel while pregnant, it could be considered kidnapping. None of these are hypotheticals. These things are already happening. Come on, give mama a hug. You didn't give mama a hug. You can do it again. Back up, back up. Damn, face, back up, mama. Come on. 
Get, get Look your mama. mama. Katie Derevitz, who lives in Alabama, is one of these women. She suffered from severe epilepsy since she was a teen. It's like a electricity storm. Like your brain is getting tased by 100,000 tasers. <laughs> Years ago, she became pregnant and then miscarried. She says her doctor told her that anti-seizure medications could raise the risks of birth defects. When Katie became pregnant again, she stopped taking her medication. Instead, she relied on marijuana to help regulate her seizures, thinking it posed the least risk to her unborn son. Look Tell me what letter it is. Look up here. You know. You it. know. Look, Will. After she gave birth yeah. in 2014, yeah. Katie and her baby were both drug tested. It was about a week after I had, uh, had been home. I remember one morning I got a phone call from, from the police station asked me if I was home. And they come in immediately after that. It's like barged in, immediately put me in handcuffs. Two big detectives showed up with bulletproof vests and like, you know, some big time telling me I can't move a... certain places in my own house. And I'm like, you know, y'all are taking my wife yeah. away after she just gave a birth, you know. I, uh, you know, I, I'm telling Katie, was, you know what, I'm sorry, I love you, but yeah. I can't I can't fight them, you know. I, I'll just get killed. I mean... I didn't know how long I was going to be in there, exactly what they were going to charge me with. And um, I was just really scared that I wasn't going to be able to see my family again. Because they were, they were talking about putting me in prison for, what, like 15 to 20 years? 10 years. For a long time. What exactly were you charged with? chemical endangerment of a child. A law intended for people that were like cooking meth around their children, yeah. you know, which of course is bad, you know, but Katie tried to do what she thought was best what, for our son and What I knew was going to save us, because if I had a seizure, like it was a high percentage of both of us dying, but it was higher for him to get hurt than me. In 2006, Alabama passed its chemical endangerment of a child law. The architects of the law intended for it to protect children from homes where drugs were being made. But prosecutors and judges effectively turned it into a fetal personhood law. Individual prosecutors thought, I'm going to use that law as a mechanism for responding to pregnant women who use drugs. The state Supreme Court of Alabama, whose chief justice is deeply anti-abortion, ruled that the law could apply to the unborn in the womb. And once that law was upheld, hundreds of women have since then been arrested based on the fact that they used any amount of any controlled substance, and including ones that their physicians have legitimately, appropriately prescribed to them. Katie spent eight days in jail, her family says the case cost them more than $10,000. Other than her having epilepsy, she had a healthy pregnancy. She had never been arrested. She had never been in trouble. Yeah, you're driving a house. I think that we're the lucky ones because we was able to get Katie's case dismissed with a lot of work and a lot of people on her side. What are you most concerned about in this political landscape? I'm concerned that it's going to get worse, nitpicking and looking at the mother, trying to see if she did something wrong. If someone has a stillbirth, for them to start looking to see what the mother did wrong. And I think that a lot of innocent women are going to get arrested before things change. If the concept of fetal personhood takes hold, what's at stake for women goes far beyond abortion. With two Supreme Court justices appointed by Donald Trump, it's a new era. And the future of reproductive rights is now in the hands of the most conservative court in decades. 
The nomination and appointment of Kavanaugh is deeply disturbing. And not only because of the risk that Roe v. Wade would be overturned and abortion might be recriminalized, but the much larger implications of all that, which is that women will go to jail. I tried to imagine for like an hour what it would be like to be pregnant and have an abortion. I don't think I'll, I can wrap my head around it. I don't think I will. I don't think I'll ever know. <laughs> These are laws that are really about a much larger agenda. And it is an example of misogyny that itself can justify incredible cruelty to the people who get pregnant. <laughs>